All right, welcome to the Milwaukee Memory Project. It is December 13th, 2020. Um, I'm Lad Stanton and my partner is Aiden Washington and we'll be interviewing uh, Mrs. Wanda of Montgomery. Mrs. Wanda Montgomery, thank you for being here. Thank you. So can you, let's just start off by describing where, can you describe where and when you were born? I was born uh, November 17th. 1954 in the city of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. At the time, I was born at uh, Milwaukee County Hospital that is uh, used to be on the grounds of where Freighter Hospital is now. Okay, and uh, what neighborhood did you grow up in? The majority of my childhood, I grew up in what is called Hillside Projects. And it is um, between Walnut and Valite. Um, 7th or 8th Street to uh, about 5th. Um, and that um, complex is still there. It's within walking distance now of Pfizer Forum and a number of the larger um, complexes downtown Milwaukee. What would you say your experience is like living down there? And how would you say that shaped your childhood growing up? Um, well, you know, it, it's been so um, for me, it was the neighborhood, I mean, it was a pretty big area. And so a lot of people lived in that area. Um, there were, um, it was kind of a graduation type process. So some of the uh, units were say big enough for a family of a mom and dad and two kids. And then you started getting larger as your families grew. So we lived in three different locations in the same um, area. So for me, what we ended up being able to do was you really develop um, long-term relationships. So I met people when I was, you know, two, three, four, five years old, all the way up till I was 14 before we moved from Hillside Projects that um, I built relationships with uh, kids that today we are still friends. Uh, many of them live in Milwaukee. Some may live in other parts of the country, but those are relationships that um, have been long lasting. I think the other thing for me, how it shaped uh, who I am today is um, we enjoyed, uh, you know, playing together when, when you know, I, I don't know what you guys consider playing, um, but we used to get up in the morning, get dressed and go outside and we would just play made up games um, all day long until as my parents would say, when the street lights come on, it's time for you to come in the house. And we were safe. Um, we didn't have, uh, we had a TV, but not like, you know, now with multiple channels and our TVs went off at 10.30, 11 o'clock at night uh, I mean, they went off. It wasn't 24 seven, they went off. You didn't, didn't get anything to the next day. We didn't have, we had phones, but in part of my childhood, we had party lines where there was one phone that was either in somebody's apartment or in the hall and we all used it. So you didn't have your own phone necessarily. But, um, uh, I played with girls just like I played with boys um, and we were safe. Um, I, um, I'm the second oldest in my family. So um, it was an older sister, myself, and then three brothers. So I tended to play more with my three brothers than I did with my older sister. And so, um, you know, I could be rough, but they helped me to get that way. But I'm not like that now. Um, but what I will say is we had fun just being kids. You know, we were creative. We had um, games that we played uh, 
and I would say things to you now you, you probably never heard of it. Your parents may not have heard of it. It was like, pom, pom, pom away, let your horses run away. And it's kind of like you have, you have um, everybody on one side and then one person. So you'd have to run from one end of the field to the other. And whoever the person that one person was, that tag, they would try and tag as many people as they could. And whoever they tag, then they have to go to that side. And then you just keep doing that until you get down to the last person and they win because everybody then is trying to catch them. So um, you could do that all day. Um, and we played marbles. We played jacks. Um, we played, you know, in the dirt. I mean, you know, you made mud pies. We didn't have all of the, the cutesy stuff. We, we made them up. So um, I think it helped me, um, number one, to develop friendships um, that are long term. And, uh, and we didn't always agree. So I had uh, fights like kids may have today. But we fight today. And two days later, we're back playing together. Unfortunately, that doesn't happen so much today. But um, yeah, so we learned how to fight be mad at each other and then figure it out and be back playing, you know, the next week or in a few days. So. Okay. And you seem to mention that you had a bigger family. So, and you're uh, the older of most siblings. So what was that like growing up? Did you have to watch over them a lot? You know, um, not so much because my mother was at home and um, so not necessarily watch over them, but we set the example. So the older kids, you know, if you're smart, you watch what happens to them and you don't <laughs> repeat it. Um, and we were pretty close in age. So my sister and I are a year apart. My brother after me is two years. And then the next brother is a year. The next brother is a year. Then the sister, I think, is two years. Then the next brother is a year. Then the next sister is maybe a couple of years. Then after her, nine years. <laughs> so um, for a long time, there were eight of us. And we were pretty close in age. And then um, the, next, the next one would have been nine years. And so she pretty much, um, when she was born, I was leaving to go to college. So we never really spent long term in the house together. And um, she was pretty much raised almost as an only child because of the, the age difference. And back then, um, three of my brothers, the three that I spoke about that came directly after me, all three went into a branch of the military at age 17. So, um, Two went into the Navy and one went into the Army. And then the youngest brother did not go into the military at all. But the three that came behind me all went into the military at 17, which at that time, um, a lot of young men did go. They made that choice um, because you could make a career out of it. Uh, you could go for four years and, and um, have your college paid for. And this was, and I don't know, ROTC might have been in existence, but they just went directly, you know, enlisted because they could at that time. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we were pretty close, but um, uh, I think some of the things that, in terms of me helping, as I got older, probably in my junior and senior year of high school, I helped to do more things at home. So. I would cook. Um, at that point, my mother was starting to uh, get into the workforce. And so I would prepare meals. Um, I don't think I did a whole lot of babysitting because we went together as a family. You know, if we went to church, we all went. Um, if my mother, she didn't do a lot of the grocery shopping. She would um, give me and my sister uh, the grocery lists and we'd go to the grocery store with the list and with the money or food stamps. 
and um, we would do the grocery shopping. And back then, before Uber and before, um, what's the other? You got Uber and you got Lyft and you got, before they became popular today, we used to have um, just older men that um, were vetted by the grocery store that would be there. And if you needed a ride home from the grocery store, they would take you home. And it wasn't a set fee. You would just give them a, a donation. And so that's what we would do. We would walk to the grocery store, which was in walking distance, do the shopping. And one of those men, and my mother would tell us who to, who to ask, Mr. Smith or whoever, to bring us home. And that's how we did it. So I helped out in, in ways like that. Sure. Okay, next, can you walk us through uh, what your life was like in grade school? Ooh, you know what? I remember my grade school teachers, <laughs> Miss C. Jackson, Miss B. Jackson. Isn't that interesting? Um, one was my kindergarten teacher and one was the first grade teacher. I remember having um, uh, community police officers and we had a police officer that was designated in our area that walked around. His name was Ted. Um, so we all knew who Ted was. Um, but, you know, grade school, we, we walked. So it was maybe three blocks from where we lived. So you knew really before, um, you knew who your teachers were going to be before you got to those grades because teachers tended to stay. And so, um, all of my siblings, we probably went through the same classes. Uh, but I did well in, in grade school. Um, back then, you went through um, kindergarten through sixth grade. And then middle school was seventh and eighth. So, no, 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 I take that back. It was sixth, seventh, and eighth. So grade school went through fifth. And then we went uh, we went further away from middle school. But um, I enjoyed grade school. And the other thing is, a lot of the kids that were in my classes were the kids that lived, lived in the neighborhood. So we knew each other. Um, it wasn't where kids were being bussed in. Um, we walked to school. So we knew, um, you know, who we knew over the summer who our teacher was going to be and who was going to be in our class. Yeah, going back to you saying that you lived about three blocks away from your school, what was that like? Would you say that that was easier, especially being down in like grade school that you kind of knew everyone that you were going to school with? So did you- You know what? Yes. And you know what? That still happens today, but it happens in the suburbs. Yeah. Most suburbs are, they have their own school district and those kids live you know, you may live a little further, but you live in the same community. You go to the same grocery stores. You go to the same barbers and beauticians, a lot of the same things, the same parks. So you build those relationships. Um, so we, you know, we could walk to school together, get in class and do what we need to do, walk home together. We all knew each other. So we, we walked together. And then we knew, well, let's get our homework done. And then we're going to come outside and play. So we knew, you know, everybody knew. And not only that, parents, their parents knew us. So I couldn't do anything and get away with it because Miss So-and-so knew my mother. And so, and she could discipline me. So if I was out doing something I wasn't supposed to do, I didn't have to wait till I got home because she would discipline me and then she'd tell my mother. So I'd end up getting it twice. Um, so no, we, we, it did, it was a village. We did help to raise um, all the kids in the neighborhood, not just our own. And some of those uh, mothers that were my friends, parents and dads, I know them today. Those that are still living, we, if we see them, they remember us, we remember them. 
and um, you know they can tell us some stories about some of the things that we did. So, yeah. Okay, uh, were you involved in, or what did you uh, do in your free time during grade school? Like, were you involved in any extracurricular activities? Well, we had um, back then what we called. Well, I was involved in the brownies and Girl Scouts. And we had 4-H club. So 4-H club where we could go and, and do gardening things and learn um, different arts and crafts. Um, and there was a 4-H uh, club right um, in a community center within um, Hillside Projects. And then there was the community center too. So you could um, spend time there going and, and getting involved in more structured activities. The other thing that we had available to us is during the summer, we had day camp that we could go to. Um, and uh, for a long time, it was where you went to Lake Park. And I don't know how familiar you are. Um, Lake Park is down uh, near the lake. Um, we take a bus there and spend the day there, not, not necessarily hiking, but you would be hiking because you'd be walking through the, the areas down there, go down to the beach, um, do some uh, campfire type stuff, just right there in the park, and then come back home at the end of the day. Um, but for the most part, during, during school, or during summer, a lot of the activities were planned right there in the area in which we live. Because most of us did not have cars. And this was before, and those, when we did get cars, this is before seat belts. We used to be piled in a car, eight kids, two parents, cars with no not much bigger than they are today, but we would be three in a lap. So the big kids, the next one, and the next one. And you just hold on to each one and no seat belts. And that's how we got around. Or we walked. Or we got bikes at some point. Um, that was before helmets. <laughs> so a lot of things that are required today, we never had. But you know, it's many more cars on the street and many more bikes on the street and there, so it's a good thing. Yeah. Okay, so there's like a large, um, like diversity of activities that you can do in 4-H. Which ones were you involved in? Um, well, 4-H provided home economics. So, I grew up in an era that was pretty um, gender specific. So girls did the cooking and sewing and boys did the outdoor stuff. So, or um, woodcraft. You know, it was, it was during a time that, well, girls don't do that. Girls do this. And so um, I learned how to sew which was a good thing because as an adult, at some point in my life, I um, uh, made a business out of sewing. So I made money as a stay-at-home mom and, um, and I know how to cook, which are not, <laughs> it's a good thing to know. So those are pretty much the activities that I did. And you know, we learned things about um, some of the uh, horticulture, you know, some of the trees and plants, because every year in the projects, what you got every year is you got an allotment of uh, plants or flowers that you could plant in your yard right by your house. And you got grass seeds, because I told, as I shared earlier, we used to play in this big field where we would just run. It wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't, it's supposed to be grass, but every year we would run till the grass was gone. So then every year they'd give you new grass seeds and you plant and then we would have a path through it. So, um, so you know, you learn things like that. And how to garden. We, I mean, we had a small area that we could plant um, 
some vegetables, not a whole lot, but some vegetables. All right. Uh, so now moving on to middle school, can you tell us more about that and what that was like? Well, um, I went to, uh, my sister and I both went to Samuel Morris Middle School. Um, and at the time it was off of 84th and Congress. Now it's actually the Hmong American School. Um, but we lived where we lived down on um, uh, 9th and Summers. And um, we had to take the city bus. So we took two buses and I can't remember the exact route, but in order for us to get to school on time, we had to leave between six and 6.30 to catch the bus to go to school. Um, so that's what we did. And we did that um, for, uh, well, middle school. So she would have started before me and then um, I joined the next year. And what was happening back then is the Milwaukee Public Schools was trying to get all of um, their graduations to be um, in June, because at one point they used to have graduation in December and then in June. And they're trying to get all the graduations to June and in middle school, I would have been, I think I was going to be graduating in December. And in order to catch or move to June, I had two options. I could um, stay back a semester or a year, pretty much. Or I could go to summer school for two summers and take the core classes and then skip the eighth grade. And so that's what I did. Now, my sister didn't like it because that meant we started ninth grade together. And people would always get these questions. How are you both in the same grade? And so it was because I went to summer school for two summers and took the core classes that I would have taken a year in um, eighth grade and was uh, moved up to um, to ninth grade along with her. So middle school um, for us, it was at the time that they were starting to do um, integration. Schools are pretty, as I share with you, we walked to school. So we were, um, everything was neighborhood. You walked to school, you had your friends, all of the things pretty much that we needed were within our area. Um, but this was an opportunity, my mother thought, for us to um, get a better education because the one thing that we learned is that depends on where your school was, really had an impact on what type of um, academic program you would be exposed to. And um, Samuel Morris at the time um, was predominantly white. And so we were two of the few students that integrated Samuel Morris. But even going to a predominantly white school, the black students still, there's a book out that talks about why are all the black students sitting together in the cafeteria? Because that's, that's who they felt comfortable with. And I reversed that question and say, why are all the white students sitting together in school? Because that's who they feel comfortable with. So we're no different, um, but I ended up, um, we ended up going to the school, um, we built, and again, a lot of the students that we went to Samuel Morris with, we're still connected to today because there were so few of us. And so we, we got to know each other. We really developed relationships and we're still friends today. Um, it was difficult. Um, because we were coming from the projects. And if you don't understand the projects, that's where low income families lived to where you have predominantly white students who lived in nice houses, who walked to school, and we were taking the city bus. Um, and that was a whole nother story. Um, 
that was traumatic in some respects. Uh, I think it was the last year. And I don't know why this happened, um, but we rode the bus to and from school and a couple of days a week, no rhyme, no reason, there would be young black men that would get on, on the school bus. And I think they were probably teenagers that would get on the, not the school bus, on the city bus. And they would harass white people. And they would ask them for things. And if they didn't do it, they would just beat them up on the bus. I mean, just no rhyme. Why it happened, I don't know. And of course, by the time police would get there, they're gone. Um, and this happened a few times. But getting back to my experience, we learned a lot um, uh, academically. I think in the beginning, we were a little challenged because we were behind. But being challenged and having the support, because I think at the time, the school district needed to prove that this worked, that if you uh, move students out of their environment, but provided them with an opportunity to learn and with certain supports they could uh, achieve academically. And so we were able to do that. Um, I can tell you this without hesitation or without reservation. I know that I met white students I could not tell you any of them today, but I can tell you the black students that I met at Samuel Morris. So in terms of relationships, it wasn't there. Now teachers, I remember some of my teachers from middle school. As a matter of fact, one of them, um, he stayed in touch with me. His name was Mr. Jasna. And he became principal and he became, I think he might have even become superintendent of MPS at one point. But I stayed in touch with him. Um, and I had a math teacher named Mr. Joseph Fisher. So some people, you know, you remember over the years and um, because they, they, they took, they paid attention to making sure we were successful. And so, um, uh, yeah, so that was middle school. I don't recall being involved in a lot of extracurricular activities. I know I was involved in home ec, but because we rode the school bus, I mean, not the school bus, the city bus, um, we couldn't stay after school pretty much too late because we needed to get back home. And it was a good, I said it was a good hour ride, and it was two buses. And I, we needed to be together. We couldn't just... Um, you know, uh, she stay after school and me not. We had to be together so that we had that backup. Yeah, I think just a really interesting part of your story is uh, being the first to integrate at your school. So can you go on more about that? Like, was there were there any tensions or what was like your day-to-day -day life during that time? Well, like I said, I think because there were enough of us that we gravitated to each other. I don't recall ever having um, any uh, deliberate tensions, but it's so long ago, it's hard to remember. And um, because we had support from our family and other students, it was nothing that was long lasting. And we had, we had advocates, we had teachers that were there to support us. Um, black teachers as well as white. So the, in terms of the teachers, we had diverse teachers there. Um, and um, there were enough students that we could develop relationships and we supported each other. Um, academically, I did well because if I hadn't, I would not have been able to do the summer schools in advance. So um, academically, I did well to be able to um, skip a grade. Yeah, so it lets you know that even though um, uh, elementary might not have been at the same level, I had the ability to learn and excel and be able to graduate um, earlier than um, anticipated. Do you think that presented any challenges in itself? 
because it seemed like you made friends during that grade. And do you think that was kind of hard graduating from those group of friends that kind of like you said that you would then go into the same grade as your sister? Do you think that kind of felt different hanging out with your sister's friends? Or do you think that kind of felt not as bad because you two were so close? Well, my sister and I were close in age, but she is, um, put it like this, when we were growing up and I said that I spent more time with my three brothers, a lot of people didn't even know we had an older sister because she stayed in the house. She stayed, she didn't socialize at all. And you know what, even today, she still doesn't. Um, and so a lot of times people think I'm the oldest because I'm the one that's visible and out and doing things. But um, she didn't like it. Um, and, and I'll share once we move on, because I think you may ask me questions about high school and, and college, I don't know. Um, but I can share with you some experiences there and what I tried to do to allow her those opportunities to have that space and, um, you know, have her own area, not me infringing upon it. But we had some of the same friends and some different friends. Uh, we were not in all the same classes. Um, she was in band and I was in um, like drill team. So she played um, the, the violin from middle school all the way through high school. Um, I was the more social butterfly, put it like that. So she was more nerdy, you know, big glasses and different things and stayed in the house and I was out and really engaged in doing things, which I still do today. Um, and um, she's not, so. Okay, with that, uh, we can move on to high school. So can you describe, where did you go to high school and can you describe your experience with that? So the first thing is when we left um, Samuel Morris, we were still living in the projects and we were about to transition. Um, uh, my parents had put an offer in on a house and the house was on Martin Luther King Drive um, I sent, I sent some pictures. You guys probably saw them or maybe, maybe not. It's a big brick house. It's still there. Um, and so for high school and back then, like I said, you went to your neighborhood schools and our high school at that time that was designated was Lincoln High School, which was on the east side of Milwaukee on Cass. And so, and at that time, Lincoln went from sixth grade to 12th. So you could have actually gone to Lincoln middle all the way through high school. And so because it was back then, you know, it was really uh, kind of the, um, the school that everybody wanted to go to. They had the greatest basketball team, drill team, band and all of that. So we went to um, Lincoln for ninth grade and um, we walked sometimes or we rode the city bus and every day we would come home and at this point we were both in the same grade. So we were both in ninth grade. We would come home every day. We never had homework. We had books and we had, and so after a month or so, my mother would ask, where's your homework? And we said, we did it. What do you mean? We did it already. How could you do your homework already? Well, we explained to her that all of the work that we had done at Samuel Morris in middle school is what they were teaching us at Lincoln in ninth grade. And so we'd already done it. I mean, literally, we had done it in seventh and eighth grade. And so to do it again in ninth grade, it was a breeze. And so she was like, okay, well, this isn't going to work because then it's like we're spending a year without advancing because we've already done this. And so at the same time that we went to Lincoln, we also had the opportunity to go to Riverside. And so we finished ninth grade at Lincoln. Um, and like I said, we would repeated what we already knew. 
So we, she enrolled us in Riverside. So we went to Riverside at 10th grade and from 10th through 12th grade. And Riverside was a pretty integrated school. Um, it probably was still predominantly white, but it was more, more diverse than many schools. And it was academically challenging. And um, so that's where we went. And again, I, I don't know why. I guess I just like to get stuff done. So I um, got in there and got my classes. And by 12th grade, um, I'd finished all my uh, classes I needed to. And I, I worked, uh, I left school in the morning. I mean, after my morning classes and I worked um, at m and Bank in the afternoon. So I, I was on a track of um, office education where I learned how to type, do shorthand. Do you guys know what shorthand is? That's a thing of the past. But <laughs> I learned how to do shorthand. And um, in high school, they used to have these, um, kind of like they do forensics now, where you go and you compete against other schools they used to have like office education competitions where you go and you um, test on the 10 key adding machine you test on typing so I used to type like 99 words a minute and that was on a typewriter not a computer so you had to type the speed and be accurate and um, so by by um, my senior year, I was able to um, work in the afternoons and I worked for m and Bank in the proof department. And so my sister was in school all day and I would leave school at noon and take the bus downtown to m and Bank, which is now BMO Harris on 7th. It was 770 North Water Street. Um, but in high school, um, I was, you know, I took the basic, you know, Spanish and English and math. Um, I remember, um, again, some of the guys uh, that were in my class, one of my English classes, um, we had a teacher, and I didn't know this back then, but I know it now. She was an alcoholic, but she was our English teacher. And she'd come to school. She'd be there all the time. But a lot of days she wasn't as in tune to what was going on. And so I had guys that would sit behind me in class and they would, you know, pull my hair or pull my jacket or whatever. And I'd turn around and say something and the teacher would always see me turning around and not them what they were doing. But um, we, um, uh, I was involved in track. I was involved in the drill team. You know, we were very involved in, in school spirit. You know, the, we did, um, and I don't know that schools do this anymore now, where you have, like for homecoming, it used to years ago, where you had the big parades and you had the floats like you do in the 4th of July parade. We used to do all of that. Um, <clears throat> so I was real involved in, in school activities, but academically, um, made sure to get my work done. Um, we walked to school, um, Riverside from my house. So our house was on 3rd and Locust. We walked from 3rd, well, no, 3rd and Center. So you'd walk down Center to um, Humboldt, and then Humboldt up to Locust. And then Locust, you'd walk over the bridge. And there you are. You're at Riverside. So it's a long way, but when you're walking with a bunch of people and as you're walking along, people say, you know, they go off to their block or they go off to their house. And so you had people to walk with you or we rode the bus. Of course, in the wintertime, you, you'd ride the bus, but uh, it was one bus. You get on the corner, get the bus on third and center. It would take me all the way to school. So, um, uh, and again, building relationships. There was a teacher. We were on the, We were at Lincoln for one year. There was a teacher that I met there. She was my homeroom teacher. Her name is Miss Carol Haywood. Um, 
and she was married and had one son. And she saw something in me, I guess, and asked me if I would babysit for her son. And they lived in a building downtown, was called Juno Village. And at the time, probably the majority of the Milwaukee Bucks lived in the same apartment building. That's where Kareem Abdul-Jabbar lived. And so I'd be on the elevator sometimes with him. Can you imagine? Here I am, a ninth grader, uh, five foot two, five foot three, and then he walks on the elevator like, whoo, and I'm like, okay. So, uh, but they lived in the same building. So I got to see a lot of the players um, and I babysat for her for years. And to this day, we are still friends. I am currently the, the uh, village president in Brown Deer and she lives in Brown Deer. So she's one of my constituents. She collects signatures for me and, um, and her son. Uh, we still are in contact. So that was a relationship that was started in ninth grade and now 50 years later almost, yeah, 50 years later, we're still friends. Um, and, um, uh, but in, in high school, you know, of course I had a boyfriend. My boyfriend went to Lincoln. So I met my boyfriend at Lincoln and I dated him all the way through high school. While I was at Riverside, he was at Lincoln. Um, and, you know, we had friends that were there, but we have more friends and long lasting relationships with those that we went through um, all of our high school years with. And again, although my sister and I were in the same school, she had a set of friends and I have a set of friends. Um, we all knew each other, but you gravitate more to people that um, you have like interests. I sang in high school um, with a group. There were uh, four of us, four women, and we did the talent shows and different things like that. Um, I don't know how I was doing it in high school because I cannot sing at all today. Not at all. I don't even want to hear myself sing, so <laughs> maybe it was because I was in a group and you couldn't hear me. <laughs> All right. Uh, recently in our class, we went, well, we talked about the civil rights protests in the 60s. Were you witness to any of those and what did you think of them? I participated. So um, when I was in, so when I was in middle school, I think it might have been the year that Martin Luther King died in 1968, um, we were at school that day and we got the news. And um, so there are two things going on here. One, I participated in open housing marches and those were in the 60s before King died. And there was a church that's located, the building is still there. Um, well, not the original building, but there is a building there, um, St. Boniface Church. It was on 12th and Center. And um, there was a priest there, Father Grappi. And Father Grappi was involved with the civil rights movement for open housing. And so every day after school, we would go to St. Boniface Church and we would march from the north side to the south side. And the, the, the whole notion was to march across the bridge to say that Black people can go from the north side to the south side and beyond. Because at that time, for the most part, Blacks in Milwaukee lived in a particular area. You, you know, there was just no opportunity for you to move out of that area. So yes, I participated in those marches. Um, they were peaceful. You know, we sang songs, we had signs. And while we did that, there were people that were advocating for the laws to be changed. One of those people was Lloyd Barbie, who was a civil rights attorney. And his daughter, Daphne Barbie, went to my high school and um, we're friends today and she's an attorney today and lives in Hawaii. 
So I visited her a couple, twice in Hawaii. Um, but her dad was able to change, um, be the, the lead on some legislation in the state to change the open housing uh, laws. In terms of um, the riots in 68 or 69, um, that happened when we were still living in the projects. And I remember the day it happened, um, it was on a Sunday when the, there was uh, a shooting that occurred um, a young man and um, uh, the riots broke out and the riots for the most part were in an area where we ended up moving to King Drive. They were on Third Street uh, where there was looting, there was burning of buildings, there was shootings there um, and we lived in the projects and this happened, we didn't know about it till the next morning when we got up and we were told we could not leave um, the area in which we lived. And before, and then we had a curfew. You had to be in the house by a certain time. And we were under martial law pretty much because they had army tanks that drove around the neighborhood. I mean, literally army, like the, like you go on the war and those, I don't know what they call the trucks, you know, the trucks with the covers and arms. So, so it wasn't the police. There were actually armed military that drove around the neighborhood to make sure that people were home. And, and if you weren't, you could get arrested. If you violated that curfew, you would get arrested. And so I can't remember how long that went on, but um, because we were not involved in in it, we were younger, so we were not out. My parents were not out, but we had to comply with what they said, and um, and we did. Um, you know, there was there was a um, uh, couple people that died, and then a lot of the stores and things that we had utilized were were gone. They were burned, and so. And that area never really completely came back. Now it's being redeveloped. It's called Bronzeville. Now it's being redeveloped. Some of those areas are actually being repurposed. Um, people are, you know, buying them and, and, and doing new things. So, um, and some of the areas, you know, it's called Brewers Hill. And, and um, let, uh, what is it? Um, Lindsay, yeah, can't think of the Lindsay Park or something like that. So they got different names for the neighborhoods, but they they revitalized it. However, I, I recently read an article where there's a challenge now because a lot of those houses that were built to bring the area back up, they can they're starting to be challenged with the taxes because of developments like Pfizer Form is causing the taxes to go up and their property values. And so people don't know how they're gonna stay in the homes they've been in for 30 years and longer because of the, um, the uh, new development, so. But yes, I was involved in them, um, never harmed. Uh, um, but so when I see people today that are marching um, and folks say, you need to come and do it, I said, I did it. I did it. it. Now it's your turn. You know, it's a, it's a different cycle. And I have participated in some of the marches of late, but not, I mean, there are people still marching today from the, from May. They're still marching. So, but we, we did it for 200 and something days in, uh, back in the 60s to the laws change. Okay, let's talk about life after high school now. What did you do? Did you go to college? Or if not, what was your experience in the workforce like? And you can take us all the way through that. So um, remember I said my sister and I ended up in the same grade. So we graduated together. 
um, and we were both accepted to UW Madison. And what I chose to do to allow her that to get the college experience first, I got accepted to Madison, but I deferred my um, uh, going until January. So she went in September and I stayed back and worked. So I was already working. Remember I had the job that I was working at m and um, half days. And so um, I stayed and worked at m and full time for a semester to allow her that opportunity to go ahead and at least be a semester ahead of me. So it felt like she um, uh, was doing something that I, you know, she started to build her own relationships and all that. Now I would go up and visit on some of the weekends. So um, uh, she was there, I would go up and visit. And I started in January of 1973 for uh, my college. But before I went, um, I would go up, I said, and go to the parties and I met people. So I met this young man um, that my sister introduced me to. And we went on our first date in November, my birthday, November of 1972. And then I went to school in uh, January and we kept dating. And I would not advise this for anyone today, but we did. Um, we had a major snowstorm in April of 1973. And I was in school in Madison. He and I got engaged in April. So we met in November of 1972. We got engaged in April of 1973. And we got married in August of 1973. So all within nine months. And this past August, we were married for 47 years. Now, so what that meant is he was in college too. And, um, after a year, we decided we both didn't need to be in school at the same time. Financially, we couldn't do it. And so I came out and a year later, we had our first child. So I started working. He was working part-time. But to make a long story short, we had our first child, I was working. He came out a year or so later, not graduated, but came out and work, started working full-time. Um, and we both said, we'll go back to school. You know, we'll go back and finish. Well, my go back and finish, um, took 14 years from 73, took me 14 years. By then we were still together and I had three children. So our kids were five, well, four to five years apart. So our first, our daughter um, was born at 73, no, 74, 74. Our son was born in December of 77, so almost four years. As a matter of fact, his birthday is Tuesday. He'll be 43. Then four years later in 82, or almost five years, our youngest was born. So I had, you know, I became a homemaker and working and I'd stay home and I created businesses like sewing and um, the other job I had for a while. And we stayed in Madison. My husband's from Indiana. We stayed in Madison for, let's see, 73. We moved from Madison in 79 back to Milwaukee. Um, he had never lived in Milwaukee before. But um, as a stay-at-home mom, one of the ways I made money, remember I told you early on I typed and I could type 90 words a minute or 99 words a minute? Um, I had a job at the university working for professors 
where um, like now they write papers, white papers, or it's not dissertations, but it's, it could be research papers. So because I was so good, when um, I went on maternity leave, they would hire me at home and I got paid a dollar and 50 cent a page. Well, at 99 cent, uh, I mean, 99 words a minute, I could type a, you know, pretty decent number. So I made money typing papers at home. Um, so I could take care of my kids and the house and do that. Um, so I was in clerical positions for years. And I think it was um, like 1985, 85 or 86. I took a job with the University of Wisconsin here working in the School of Allied Health and um, as a clerical. And after I was there just a couple of weeks, the I was working for two women and one of them called me in her office and asked me why I was doing the work I was doing. And I said, because I need to work. And it was part-time. <clears throat> and she said, no, I mean, why are you doing this kind of work? I said, well, because I, I need to. And she said, have you gone to college? I said, yeah, I did, but I need to go back because I had I didn't finish. She said, yeah, you do, and you need to go now. And I'm like, well, I can't. I, I mean, you know, I don't have the means. I don't have this and all. So I made all the excuses. And she said, no, you're going, and we're going to show you how. So they basically walked my application through at UW-Milwaukee. And um, uh, I got accepted to the School of Education uh, on probation because my grades weren't the greatest uh, from UW-Madison. And um, I got enrolled in a program called um, Community Education, where the first class that you take, you could earn 21 credits from one class. And you earn it by, they had um, seven different topics. And you would do the research and write a paper on each topic. And then you had to present it. And based on the rubric, you could earn three credits. So you earn three credits for the class. And then you earn another three credits for each one that you, you did and got passed. And I think I earned 18 credits from one class. And so that really just kind of, you know, kick-started me. And I was on a roll. So I was able to finish in three years. And um, my the two women I was working for, whatever I registered for in my classes, they would let me leave the office, go to class, and I got paid. And I could go in the office and type and do whatever I had to do right there. So they supported me academically to do what I needed to do. And then um, uh, my kids were in school. So my oldest graduated eighth grade. I graduated college the same time. And what I learned from that is up until I got my degree, I was actually training my bosses how to be bosses. So I had the skills, I didn't have the credentials. And as soon as I got the credentials, that was it. I just went right up. Um, so, uh, and I was able to, from that point on, at, uh, professionally, I've just been going up, up and up. And the School of Education that I got my degree in, I will be the graduation speaker next Saturday for the graduating class. So full circle. So they want me to talk about my experience and what I've been able to do since I got that degree and gone on to my professional career, as well as, um, you know, I've subsequently gotten a master's 
from Marquette. So, um, yeah. So I will be doing that. But my, my um, career, it was pretty much clerical until I got the degree. And once I got the degree, I moved into administrative positions and executive positions. I've been executive director of uh, three nonprofits. One was a housing agency. Um, one uh, was a child care um, organization. I've been principal of a choice school. Um, I've been executive director of a child welfare agency that was connected to Children's Hospital. I was also director of a W-2 program, uh, which was connected to Maximus. And then I just uh, retired from Children's uh, three weeks ago, where I ended my career as uh, director of community partnerships. And what I learned over the years is all of the work that I've done was really around strengthening um, children and families. And so everything I've done just kind of blended together. And so my last uh, position with children gave me an opportunity to bring all of that experience under one umbrella and really support um, the system and their work in engaging the community through helping to strengthen families and specifically making sure that all children in Wisconsin and Milwaukee uh, specifically to be the healthiest kids in the nation. So, um, and then my latest, uh, uh, I won't say profession, but my latest uh, experience has been I ran for political office um, three years ago. And so I won and then I ran again and I won again. So, um, but yeah, so professionally, um, I built on that career. Once I left um, clerical, I never went back. Uh, earlier you said that you were down in Madison for a while. How would you compare the lifestyle that you were living down in Madison to Milwaukee? Like if there were any cultural differences, like style? Major. <laughs> Major. <laughs> um, you know, Madison is, it is really a college town. I mean, it is, um, and we live, we never lived on campus. We did when we were in college, but when we got married, we lived out further from town. But the one thing that um, I did not like about Madison, um, it was hard to build uh, relationships with uh, family and friends. Well, not family necessarily, but friends, because people were, it was such a transient city. People would come, um, whether they would be there for school, and once they got their degrees, they'd leave. Um, could be somebody coming there for a job. Once, you know, that was done or they uh, got applied to another university, they were gone. So it was a constant um, movement of people. And I didn't like that. I'm a, a person that really likes um, relationships and building on them. And it just got to be, um, you know, I'm thinking about our kids. You know, you got friends today and then next thing they're gone. Um, and so really trying to get more into a stable area when we moved back to Milwaukee, we lived in an apartment complex out. Um, it at the time was called Northridge. Um, Northridge was a major shopping area off of 80, well, 76 and Brown Deer Road. Um, and there were some fairly new apartments out there. And we moved there until we bought a house. And our, our first home was... Um, in the Glendale area. And so we lived there for a few years and then moved to um, Sherman Park. And that's predominantly where we raised our kids in the Sherman Park area, which was near Washington High School. But our kids never, um, I'm thinking our two oldest went to kindergarten only in MPS. 
and then they went to parochial school until middle school and high school. Then they went to suburban school. So they never really went to MPS other than kindergarten for the two. And the youngest never went to MPS. And I think it was because of my own experience of seeing it, the inequity in the education. And I didn't see much of that changing when they were coming up and I don't see it changing today. So, I, you know, we chose academically to uh, place our kids in schools that we felt they would, they would do better. So, but in terms of the, the change, Madison, of course, is much smaller than Milwaukee. Um, I think really college town and very transient. Um, in terms of um, diversity, very diverse, very diverse. We had a lot of foreign students um, and other, other uh, nationalities. So, um, yeah, but once we, you know, we, I, I built some, um, had some foundational things there because we, we joined a church. So I was involved in a church. But um, other than that, and we still, you know, my family was here in Milwaukee. So we could come to Milwaukee, you know, it's an hour and a half drive. So all family events, we'd come down and, you know, you could spend the night or the weekend. Um, but the opportunity presented itself for us to move back to Milwaukee. And we did. And my husband, like I said, is from Indiana, but he was from Gary, Indiana, which back in the 70s and 80s, was not the place to be moving. So that was never an option. So your current job is uh, village president of Brown Deer, is that right? Well, it's a, it's a job and no. I mean, it's, it's civic responsibility, really. Yeah. Um, you, get, you get paid a stipend, so it's not like I put in 10 hours and I get paid for 10 hours, no. Yeah, I was, it was really gonna, public service. Yeah, I was just going to ask, what made you uh, want to run for that position? Um, well, I have always been politically engaged. You know, I'd like to know who my representatives are. Um, you know, I, I uh, know Tom Barrett, the mayor of Milwaukee by first name. He knows me. I've co-chaired committees with him. I know the governor. I'm on an uh, appointment by the governor now on a council. I know the county exec. I know Gwen Moore. I know Scott Walk. I mean, I just, I believe uh, these are people. And they are elected to serve. And so I've always tried to understand the political apparatus and how things work and how they should work for all of us. And so um, we had lived in Germantown for a number of years. We built a house out there. And then as our kids were grown and gone, um, I thought this house is just too big. Um, I want to be closer in town. I want to be near my mom. And so we ended up moving into Brown Deer uh, six years ago. And when we moved here in true form, which I like to do, I wanted to meet all my neighbors. So we invited our neighbors to join us on our patio, um, kind of an open house type thing. And they did. And, you know, I'm trying to learn the law of the land. And a couple of years after we were here, they wanted to do a block party and said I should plan it. And I'm like, no, why don't we have a, a group? And so we did. We worked on planning a, a, a block party. And my experience has been you invite your elected officials. They may come, they may not come, but at least they know some of their constituents are getting together and they have an opportunity to come by. Brown Deer isn't that big. We got a little over 12,000 residents. We're on 4.5 square miles. So I sent an invitation to all of the elected officials. There were seven of them. I emailed them to their email address. And to my surprise, nobody responded. You know, they didn't say, oh, sorry, I can't make it. Um, thanks, but no thanks. Um, I would come, but I'm otherwise engaged. 
nothing. Nobody responded. So I'm thinking, did I send it to the right place? You know, I got all the emails off the website. So they didn't respond. So um, a month or so later, I decided, you know, when do they meet? So I contacted and found out the schedule. I said, I'm just going to go to the meeting because they met at night. And I went to the meeting and sat in the audience and just observed. And I was intrigued. <laughs> so I thought, hmm, this is interesting. Let me go to another meeting. So I went to several. And I'd come back home and I'd tell my husband, do you know that they did such and such and such? And they would discuss things. And then when it came time to vote, they all voted the same. Nobody, there was ne never any opposition. And so I started asking people, and a lot of people didn't know what was going on. So after a few meetings, I said, I'm concerned that, and here's the other thing that happened. The Village Hall, it's a nice place. They had seats in the audience for about maybe mm, 60 people. I was in the audience some meetings that I was the only one there. And every meeting I went to, whether I was the only one there or not, all the staff, all the elected officials, and any guests besides me, I was the only person of color every single meeting. So then I thought, they never, none, none of them ever said anything. They would walk in, they never say good evening, nothing. Just walk right by you like, and I thought, if this is supposed, they're supposed to be representing me. They won't even talk to me. So then I did a little investigation to find out what it took to be a trustee and all of that. And I got permission from my husband and my daughter who was living at home at the time. And they both said, yeah, you may as well do it because you always, you're involved in things anyway, so. I filed the papers and I filed them really early. <laughs> and so they were like, who is this woman? Um, and then once uh, I couldn't, I could not collect signatures because you had to have so many signatures to get to be on the ballot, collect so many signatures for your nomination. My husband and I had planned a trip to Paris. You could collect signatures starting um, December 1st. We were in Paris. I didn't get back to Wisconsin until the 10th. But I had already told people that I was looking to do this. So I only needed 20 signatures. Well, within a week, I had like 140 signatures. And the village clerk said, don't turn in more than 100. We don't want. So I had to pick and choose which sheets I was going to turn in. But and it was in the winter, just like now. Um, and I did what other people do when they run for office. I literally went and knocked on doors in January and February, the coldest time of the year. And because I did that, a lot of people told me point blank, we've never had a trustee come to our house before. Because you have come and I had literature, we're going to vote for you. <clears throat> so we elect two trustees every year. That year, it was two men. They were up for re-election. I knocked on enough doors, got enough information out, used Facebook, emails, and everything I could. I came in first place in a three-way race. I got 45% of the vote. So I won. Now I'm on the inside. And so I'm one new face with six other people. It didn't take me long. I told you I was an executive. It did not take me long to realize we got some issues here. And I also learned that in order for me to make effective change, I needed to be the president. 
So I filed the papers and I ran for president within the year. And they were so upset with me. How could she run to be president? She hasn't been here long enough. I didn't need to be there. I knew we needed change. I ran <coughs> against an incumbent. He had been there 18 years. And I won. And now where there were no people of color on the board, now there are four in the span of three years. So um, we needed change, but somebody needed to do it to make the change. And, and now I have people that just, I have those that love to hate me, but I got plenty that just love everything that I do. And what I'm doing is I'm utilizing the skills that I've always applied. Respect people in their positions. Do what you say you're going to do. Be transparent. Um, I don't care who calls me or who emails me. I respond to every single email and every single call. Everyone. You may not like what I have to tell you, but you will get an answer. And that was something I, I did not get. So I'm doing different. Okay, I think uh, we're ready for our final round of questions, which is kind of based on the current state and the future state of Milwaukee. So first one is, what is the number one difference about Milwaukee now that you noticed than when you grew up? We're in a lot worse shape. I think um, we have, when I was growing up, we were poor, but we didn't know we were poor. We, we had a lot of respect for ourselves and we created things that helped to make us successful. Now there are people that are poor, they know they're poor, and they're not trying to, and, and maybe circumstances have got them in a place where they don't think they can pull out of it. We believe that we could, and we did, with little resources. Um, I think that um, we grew up in a pretty segregated uh, community, and now, they say it's integrated because we can go and move wherever. But Milwaukee is the most segregated city in the country. Because it doesn't matter where you live when there's so many things that you can't have access to still today. Um, I think the inequity, um, uh, equity around health, education, jobs, um, access to capital, all of that is worse. I think it's worse now than it was back then. Um, Cause we had, we had people back then that owned their own businesses thriving. And now you can barely get that. Um, so it is, um, it's almost like we're starting all over again. And, um, you know, we had fewer people of color that were in elected positions. Now we have more. And um, it's still, cha the challenges are still there. The challenges are still there. Um, of course, what's different today than it was back then People were not killing each other back then. I shared with you earlier, we got in fights all the time. But nobody ever came out with a knife or a gun. We use these. And then the next day or whatever, a few days later or a week, we're friends again. So that, um, 
things like that, I think um, significantly, you know, when we were growing up in the projects, it's, it's uh, funny. Our doctor came to our house. We didn't go to the clinic. You had a doctor that came to the house with that black doctor's bag. We got our shots right there in the house. We didn't have to go to the clinic. So I think some things, and, and now, guess what? You got doctors coming to the house again. <laughs> you know, it's cyclical. Some things just turn around. Um, but yeah, I, um, and I think improvements and technology, I think has taken away from things that we, we learned and did as kids that our kids just don't have the same experience. You know, technology has taken the place of friendships. When I have kids that are isolated in their homes, they spend more time on their devices than they can with that social interaction. And I think it makes a difference. Um, you know, I mean, I know it makes a difference because I, um, I could be on my device, but I can also, I love the, the, the interaction with people. Um, whereas I think sometimes um, people's friends become their, uh, their te technical or their devices instead of um, real friends, so. What do you think is the number one problem facing America right now, and do you have any solutions for it? <laughs> America? Yeah. That's the question. I think the number one thing that's facing us right now is a lack of leadership. That's the number one. We grew up in a time where the leader of this country, even if they weren't telling the truth, you respected them to a point that you didn't challenge it. And um, now, uh, and I don't know, what grades are you guys in? 10th, 11th? I'm a senior. Oh, you're a senior? Yeah. And Aiden's a junior. Aiden, what are you? I'm a junior. Okay. Leadership matters, good or bad. And if you look at what's going on in our country right now, we are in the midst of the worst pandemic, the worst political upheaval because of lack of leadership. I'm not calling no party. I'm not calling no names, but when you, when you don't have someone and a leader is a person that will step up and take responsibility, good or bad. I've been in positions of leadership. If there's a mistake or something that has happened, the buck stops with you. You have to take ownership and stand on what needs to be done. And um, sometimes it's hard, but it's the right thing to do. And so I think right now, that's the number one challenge. And we have, we have a uh, transition coming. And what, what I see happening right now is the people that are leaving are trying to taint the leadership that's coming to say that they are, um, illegitimate and unfortunately some people believe that and so um that's what i see we have a lack of a lack of leadership and until we get back to that um and uh, a level of integrity we're, we're 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 spiraling out of control All right. Well, I think that's all we have for you today. I think we can wrap up this interview. So thank you, Mrs. Montgomery, for answering our questions. Thank you for your time, too. Yeah. How many, how many of these are you doing? Uh, one, we're a group of two. Um, and so we each do one interview.
but I don't know how many groups there are, but everyone in our class is doing one. Oh, wow. And then y'all gonna pull them all together? Yeah, we have a YouTube channel. Uh-oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I wish you well. I'm assuming you'll be graded. Yep. <laughs> it's our final exam. Oh, my. <laughs> well, let me know how it turns out. Yeah, absolutely. You got it. You got to get an A. As I told my students when I taught, you start with an A. <laughs> so you got to keep it. Yeah, I think we will. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. I hope I was a worthy subject. Yeah, absolutely. and uh, <laughs> and uh, congratulations on being a senior. Where are you going to college? Um, right now, my first choice is Michigan Tech in the UP. Okay. Yeah. And so. Aiden, what about you? You got another year. Yeah, number one choice is Creighton. Trying to get into nursing. Oh, okay. All right. But well, both my grandkids are at Syracuse. Okay. They just got their first year. Well, their first semester. So, all right. Awesome. Well, you guys have have a good evening. You as well. And um, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Bye now. All right. Bye bye. Yeah.